Although he never became a Grand Master, Rashid Nezhmetinov was one of the most feared players in chess history. This game against Oleg Chernikov from the 1962 USSR Team Championships shows why. Chernikov, with the black pieces, attacks Nezhmetinov's queen in what appears to be an invitation to a draw. Eyewitness Vladimir Voloshin explains. A draw by repetition will occur if white moves his queen from h6 to h4 while black attacks by bishop g7 and bishop f6. However, the Tatar master was not in a peaceful mood. 20, 30, 40 minutes went by and while Rashid was thinking, Chirnikov was walking around waiting for Nezhmetinov to offer a draw. At that moment, an excited boy ran up to Chirnikov. Mister, he sacrificed his queen to you. I did not see Chirnikov walk around any more after that. Vladimir Voloshin. Nezhmetinov kept up an irresistible initiative on the king's side, on his way to what would become one of many, many works of chess art. Rashid Gibriatovich Nezhmetinov was born in 1912 in Aktyobinsk, a tiny town on the steppes of Kazakhstan. His parents were impoverished Tatar farmhands. They died, literally worked to death, when Rashid was still a small child. The orphaned boy was sent to live with his uncle Gumer in a village outside of Nizhny Novgorod on the banks of the fabled Volga River. Conditions here were no better, however, due to the aftermath of the Russian Civil War, which had devastated the region from 1918 to 1923. Even worse, the Bolshevik policy of Prodrazvyotska, the commandeering, or theft, of the peasants' grain to feed the revolutionary army had helped cause one of the worst famines in history. The Volga famine killed more than two million children, but Nezhmetinov's life was saved by his older brother, the Tatar poet Kavi Nadzmir. Kavi arranged for Rashid to be placed in an orphanage in the ancient Tatar capital of Kazan. Tatar elements of the Mongol horde had swept through the city in the 13th century. But, unlike most of the Mongols, they settled permanently, mixing with the local Volga Bulgars to create the ethnicity and culture we now refer to as Russian Tatar. Kazang must have seemed like a paradise to young Rashid. The only happy memory he ever reported before coming to Kazang was one incident when he got to eat some fish soup on the banks of the Volga. In his time at the orphanage, however, Nezhmetinov was well fed for the first time in his life. He also received instruction in the Muslim religion and an education in the Tatar language. Rashid would remain a practicing Muslim throughout his life and he also developed a keen interest in learning particularly literature, history, and mathematics. After three years in the orphanage, Kavi Nadzmiya was able to bring Rashid into his own household. Nezhmetinov became very active in the Kazan Palace of Pioneers. 
The Soviet young pioneers were sort of like the Boy Scouts, but with the added bonus of communist indoctrination. The pioneers' palaces became bustling social hubs in which many adult guides, or uncles, visited the club, often engaging in endless chess sessions. One day, 11-year-old Rashid found a scrap of paper on the stairwell. It was a chess column from a magazine. He kept it in his pocket, unable to stop thinking about it. It even began intruding on his dreams. A few days later, Rashid was watching adults play chess at the Pioneer Club. I rejoiced when I discovered they moved the things exactly as was explained on my piece of paper. Rashid sat down to play his first chess and won every game. A man named Samsonov was so impressed he wrote a letter recommending that Rashid be admitted to the Kazan Chess Club. Against the real experts, however, Nezhmetinov enjoyed little success. There, he said, they all won from me right up to 1927, with no notion of theory and on top of that, too interested in blitz chess, I was slow to make progress. In 1927, however, Nezhmetinov, age 15, won the city pioneer championship with a score of 100%. Just three years later, Rashid became a first category player by winning the Kazan City Championship. He had also surpassed Samsonov, as this game from 1929 amply illustrates. Rashid takes the black pieces and surprises his former chess mentor with a stunning smothered mate In 1930, Nezhmetinov graduated high school. He briefly attended the Kazan Institute of Technology and took courses in weights and measures with the idea of obtaining employment in the Standards Bureau. Lack of funds, however, forced Rashid to drop out. His brother, Kavin Adzmiya, was a poorly paid newspaper editor and couldn't afford Rashid's upkeep any longer. And so it was that Nezhmetinov joined the Communist Party and set off for Odessa, Ukraine, to make his own way in the world. Neither Rashid nor his brother had ever blamed the Bolsheviks for the famine that had almost killed him. In fact, just one year earlier, Kavin Nadzmiya had published Coastal Fires, a prize-winning short story glorifying the Bolshevik role in the Russian Civil War. As for Rashid, he had enjoyed nothing but positive experiences as a member of the Soviet Palace of Pioneers. As it turned out, his Communist Party membership would put him in good stead in Odessa. In 1931, Odessa was a famed holiday resort on the Black Sea, but Rashid wouldn't get much beach time. He toiled all day long as a stoker in a steel mill. After work, however, Nezhmetinov spent all his free time at the Odessa Chess Club. The club met daily in Vorontsov's palace, which had been seized by the Bolsheviks in 1917, and currently served as seat of the Odessa Soviet. As a chess-obsessed party member, Rashid fit right in. For three years, he knocked heads with Odessa's best first category players. In 1931, Odessa had no chess masters, but it would soon produce an international grandmaster, later destined to meet Rashid over the board. That wouldn't happen for some time, however. In 1931, Yefim Geller was only six years old. In 1933, Nezhmetinov, now the Odessa chess and checkers champion, returned to Kazan, where he took steady employment at the Standards Bureau. 
He also entered the Kazang Pedagogical Institute, where he studied and taught mathematics and led an informal chess circle. Nezhmetdinov would soon get the master title in checkers, which didn't help his chess career very much. At this time, checkers was taken very seriously in the Soviet Union. It was even reported in chess magazines. However, Rashid soon received a rude awakening in the all-union tournament in Rostov-on-Don. In 1934-35, I was mainly occupied by the study of checkers. Only in 1936 did I cross swords with stronger first category chess players, Ufintsev and Dubinin. They gave me a good thrashing. Rashid understood now it was necessary to undertake a serious study of chess. But he then fell ill and was hospitalized for many months. However, in his typically optimistic fashion, Nezhmetinov recognized this as an opportunity. I took along a book of Kubel's endgame studies and solved them, without a board, in my spare time. Rashid's homework paid off. In 1939, he scored 9 on 10 in a Category 1 tournament and earned the Candidate Master title. After graduating university in 1940, Rashid was called to military service. He was promptly shipped off 5,000 kilometers east to the Baikal military district on the border of Outer Mongolia. It seemed that Rashid had been banished to the ends of the earth. This didn't stop him, however, from winning the Lake Baikal District Chess Championship in February 1941. Nezhmetinov triumphed over some stiff opposition, including Viktor Batorinsky and Konstantin Klaman. Here, Nezhmetinov watches intently as his main rival Batorinsky takes on Klaman. Although World War II proved disastrous for Nezhmetinov's chess development, causing a five and a half year period during which he played no tournaments, in truth, he was extraordinarily lucky. He always seemed to leave just before, or arrive just after, some apocalyptic battle. He arrived in Baikal after the Russians had fought a murderous battle against the mighty Japanese Kwangtung army. He was then sent to Berlin, just after the Soviets had already taken and secured the city. By sheer chance, Rashid had avoided every single combat zone in a war that killed almost 11 million Russian soldiers. In Berlin, finally, Nezhmetinov was able to resume his long-interrupted chess career. In 1946, he won the championship of the Berlin military district, finishing 14 on 15 ahead of future master and Ukrainian champion Isak Lipnitsky. In 1946, Nezhmetinov returned to civilian life, now 34 years old. His chess comeback, perhaps understandably, got off to a rocky start. However, he played himself into shape and became captain of the DSO Spartak chess team. In 1947, he showed continued improvement at the All-Union Candidate Master Tournament in Yaroslavl. He finished shared second with Tarasov, behind Holmov. This proved to be the start of a tumultuous friendship between Nezhmetinov, Tarasov and Holmov, which almost ended in disaster. In 1947, however, all was well with the world. At Yaroslavl, Rashid had filled his second master norm and was now entitled to an examination match for the title of Soviet Master of Chess. Georgi Lizitsin was appointed to be Rashid's examiner. However, 
After studying Lizitsyn's gains for months, Rashid was stunned to receive a telegram just days before the match. The Soviet Chess Federation informed him that the master Vladas Mikenas would now be his examiner. At the 11th hour, Nezhmetinov furiously prepared by analyzing a recent article Mikenas had written on his favorite weapon, Aliekhin's defense. Mikenas promised to be a formidable opponent. In the great tournament at Kemeri, 1937, he had defeated Alexander Aliekhin with the black pieces. Even worse, the game had been photographed. Aliekhin did not speak to Mikenas for years after. However, Nezhmetinov had prepared well for Mikenas's favorite night hunt variation of Aliekhin's defense. In game one of the match, Rashid shocked his opponent by playing into the hunt variation and crushing him in 17 moves. Mikenas fought back, however, and by game 11 he felt confident enough to face the night hunt variation again. Nizhnetinov destroyed him, demonstrating that it should perhaps be renamed the King Hunt Variation. After game 11, Mikenas did not try Aliekhin's defense again. In the end, the match was a tie. But since the examiner got draw odds, Rashid did not receive the master title. Still, he was encouraged by the result. It did not bring me the master title, but analysis of the games instilled in me confidence that the title was not far off. Despite this optimism, the next two years proved frustrating for Nezhmetinov. Characteristically, he was brutally frank about his own performance. I suffered a fiasco in my games against masters. In 1950, however, Rashid earned the right to play in the Russian Federation's championship in Nizhny Novgorod. These championships were contested among members of the Russian Federations only, and were thus less strong than the USSR championships, the Holy Grail in Soviet chess. However, this year's field was particularly strong, featuring Grandmaster Isaac Boloslavsky. Nezhmetinov drew his game with Boloslavsky, the heavy favorite, and went on to become the 10th Russian Federation champion. Finally, Rashid had achieved his cherished goal. He had become a Soviet master of sport in chess. Nezhmetinov, the champion of the Russian Federations, returned to a hero's welcome in Kazan. Fans were even more delighted when he again won the RSFSR title at Yaroslav, 1951, ahead of Krogios. At the semi-finals of the USSR championships in Baku, however, trouble was brewing. Some underestimation of my opponents led me to obtain only four points after 12 rounds. There may have been another reason, however, for Rashid's lackluster performance. Nizhvetinov, Tarasov and Holmov had become boisterous drinking partners. In Baku, the triumvirate, as they were known, treated their hotel room as if they were rock stars. Rashid was on the balcony, hurling plates and crockery to the street below. Kholmov attempted to bring him inside, and soon the two were locked in noisy battle. Tarasov tried to separate the combatants, 
without much success. Unfortunately, the hullabaloo attracted the attention of Grand Master Alexander Kotov. Kotov had been assigned as an observer on behalf of the Soviet Sports Committee. In fact, it's widely believed that he worked for the KGB at this time. At any rate, soon the local police were involved, and Kotov reported all three masters to the sports committee. Khulmov and Tarasov received the worst of it. They were disqualified from tournament play for one year and had their government stipend suspended. Rashid, the only Communist Party member in the group, retained his stipend and was disqualified for a shorter period of time. Given that Nizhmetinov had actually caused the incident, Khomov may be forgiven for bearing a grudge. Years later, he accused Rashid of groveling before the committee. In fact, however, all three masters were lucky. In the past, chess masters had been punished much more severely for lesser or even imaginary offenses. Leonid Kubel's brother Arvid had been executed for the crime of sending a chess composition to the foreign press. Chess master Vladimir Petrov had been sent to a gulag for the so-called crime of counter-revolutionary activities. Peter Melov had been the first Russian Federation champion in 1922. But this didn't stop him from being shot for his supposed involvement in a plot to kill Stalin. As for Rashid, he seemed to have learned his lesson. In fact, he stopped the all-night party tournament life and married. He also made good use of his enforced time off by writing the first chess book in the Tatar language. Once again, Nezhmetinov had to play himself back into shape. At Saratov, 1953, he signaled his return by winning the RSFSR championship for the third time. He overtook the leader and rising star, Lev Borogayevsky, by finishing with a startling six wins in a row. Beginning with this championship, I learned to defeat masters on a regular basis. In January 1954, Nezhmetinov finally got a chance to appear on the big stage. The 21st USSR Championships in Kyiv. Here, Rashid would face the toughest competition of his life, Russia's top grandmasters, including Tigran Petrosian and Yefim Geller. Geller was now ranked in the world's top 10, but Nezhmetinov dismantled him in a sharp struggle. Rashid also defeated legendary grandmasters Salo Flor and Andor Lilienthal, seen here enjoying a snowy day together. That's Lilienthal on the right of the screen. Against Lilienthal, Rashid produced yet another brilliancy. Lilienthal, with white, sacks a piece for what looks to be an overwhelming attack. Here, Black appears to be utterly without hope. But Nezhmetinov now launched one of the greatest counter-attacks in chess history. Rashid finished the event shared 7th, but he had proven a point by scoring 4.5 on 7 against Grandmaster opponents. 
The death of Stalin helped bring Nezhmetinov the opportunity to appear on the international stage. Stalin's successor, Nikita Khrushchev, adopted a less repressive de-Stalinization program. In this new era, travel restrictions for Soviet sportsmen were lessened. In 1954, the Soviet Chess Committee decided to answer foreign critics who claimed they only ever sent their strongest grandmasters abroad. The idea was to send four of Russia's mere masters to the international tournament in Bucharesti, 1954. Nezhmetinov was chosen along with fellow masters Semyon Forman, Viktor Korchnoi, and his old friend Ratmir Kholmov. The Soviet Sports Committee spared no expense. Before the tournament, the four masters were summoned to Moskva. Here, they underwent rigorous preparation under the guidance of Isaac Boloslavsky and David Bronstein. In Bucharesti, Nezhmetinov would face international masters for the first time. Ludiek Pachman Miroslav Filip Robert Wade Bogdan Sliva and international grandmaster and tournament favorite Yidion Stalbari. In round five, Rashid took the white pieces against Italian master Enrico Paoli and sacrificed two knights for a vicious attack. Before the fifth round, I received the joyous news of the birth of my son. At the end of the round, I sent a telegram to my wife. I congratulate you on the birth of our son, and I dedicate my game with Paoli to him. Nezhmetinov shared the lead with Korchnoi, back and forth throughout the event, until the last round. In the end, Korchnoi edged Rashid out. Nezhmetinov finished clear second. With his typical generosity, however, Nezhmetinov summed up the experience. And so yet another international competition ended with the victory of a representative of the Soviet chess school. Though he didn't win, Rashid's scintillating performance on the world stage earned him the title of international master. Nezhmetinov again made it to the big stage in Moskva, 1957, at the 24th USSR Championship. Though he only managed 13th place, Rashid distinguished himself in games against two future world champions. In 1957, Mikhail Tal was only 21 years old, but he had already electrified the chess world with his sacrificial romantic style. In round 6, Nezhmetinov took white against the magician of Riga. Playing in a style similar to Tal's, Rashid seemed to have him in some kind of self-imposed zugzwang. Here, Tal appears unable to find effective counterplay, or even a useful plan. Rashid soon took advantage of this uncertainty and punished his foe with a spectacular attacking sequence. In 
round 13, Nizhmet Dinov took the white pieces and spanked Boris Spassky in 33 moves. Spassky resigned here because of the crushing threat Queen to e6 check, which wins by force majeure. Despite these successes, however, Rashid was unhappy with his play. Only in isolated games was I able to carry out creative lines of thought to their conclusion. In most games, I had painful collapses. Tal went on to win the tournament, becoming the youngest USSR champion in history. Here, Nizhmetinov congratulates Tal on his victory. Rashid and Mikhail greatly admired one another and soon established a warm and lasting friendship. On his return to Kazan, Nezhmet Dinov faced heartbreaking news. My older brother Kavi had passed away in the prime of his creative life. A prominent Tatar author, he had helped me in many, many ways. Later that year, however, Rashid was honored with a government medal for achievement in the field of chess art. This profoundly moved me and helped me overcome my artistic depression. In Krasnodar, 1957, Nezhmet Tinov won the RSFSR championship for an unprecedented fourth time. He was flushed with new life then when he boarded the train to Satsi, 1958, on his way to glory. At the beautiful Black Sea resort of Satsi, Nezhmetinov won his fifth Russian Federation's championship. In the process, he played his immortal against Lev Bologayevsky. To this day, it is ranked by many as a contender for the greatest game of chess ever played. Rashid, with the black pieces, appears to have no good square to park his queen. His solution to the problem became one of the most spectacular moves of all time. Rook takes f4. Pologayevsky was pole-axed. Sunk in thought for a long time, I understood I was to say goodbye to all hope, and that I was losing a game that would be spread all over the world. Lev Pologayevsky. After the game, a special painting was commissioned depicting Nezhmetinov, Porogayevsky, and the Board of Destiny. Nezhmetinov carried his fresh momentum through 1958. At Vilnius, he served as captain for the Russian Federation in the USSR team championships. Under Rashid's leadership, the underdog RSFSR managed third place out of nine. Nezhmetinov also garnered the bronze medal on first board, finishing ahead of Paul Keres, David Bronstein, Yefim Geller, and Isaac Boleslavsky. With the black pieces, Rashid overwhelmed Grandmaster Boleslavsky by shattering his kingside in a trademark assault.
In 1959, however, Nizhmetinov began to feel the effects of his age in relation to his competitors, or so it seemed. During the opening ceremony at the USSR Championships in Tbilisi, Rashid learned with regret that, at age 46, he was the oldest player in the field. Perhaps the only bright spot was an artistic win with the white pieces over David Bronstein, who proved unable to withstand yet another irresistible kingside attack from the Tatar master. All the glory in this tournament, however, would belong to hometown favorite Tigran Petrosian. The Iron Tiger delighted Tbilisi fans by triumphing over a particularly strong field, including the young Turks Tal and Spassky. For his part, Nezhmetinov opined on his own disastrous performance. You think you are close to success. All of a sudden, everything falls to the ground. Your hand is empty. The firebird has flown to another. Nezhmetinov's slump lasted almost two years, but he refused to indulge in despair. He was well known by his colleagues and friends for his oft-repeated mantra, Our day will come. And so it did. In 1960, although in somewhat unusual fashion. Mikhail Tal had begun preparations for his world championship match against Botvinnik. Everyone knew that Mikhail relied heavily on his friend and countryman, Alexander Koblenz, for preparation in opening theory. However, Tal startled the chess world by asking Rashid to join his team. In 1960, I asked my friend Rashid Gibiotovich to help me prepare, and I think this move was surprisingly successful. Nizhmetinov was not a theoretician in the conventional sense of the word, but his ideas attracted my attention with their paradoxes. At first, they proved very dangerous for opponents. Mikhail Tal. And so it was that Rashid, often acting as a sparring partner, helped his friend become the chess champion of the world. A few years later, six-time Leningrad Blitz champion Genrik Chepukaitis arrived at Tal's door for an appointment to play chess. When I knocked, there was a tall middle-aged man I didn't know. I knew that Tal sometimes traveled with his uncle Robert, so I thought it was he. I accepted his invitation to play to pass the time. I was crushed in the first game, but when I lost four more games, I almost began to panic. It was very rare for me to lose in such style, going down in flames like the Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima 1905. I could accept being crushed by Tal himself, but by his uncle? Genrik Chepukaitis. Only later, when Tal returned, did Chepukaitis realize he'd been crushed by Rashid Nezhmetinov. Nineteen sixty one would prove to be yet another renaissance for the Tatar master. He finished second to Mark Taimanov at the Chigorin Memorial Tournament in Rostov-on-Don. Rashid got off to a slow start, however, in his quest for a sixth 
RSFSR Championship in Omsk. Only by surging in the second half did Rashid manage to join a group of five tied for second place behind Porogayevsky. A clear second had to be chosen because the top two would earn a spot in the next USSR championships. Nezhmetinov triumphed in the tie-breaking mini-match over Vladimir Antoshin, Anatoly Lir, and Lev Bilov. Rashid had earned his ticket to the 29th USSR championship in Baku. Though Rashid only managed 19th place, he won still another brilliancy prize in his third career victory over Mikhail Tal. Rashid, white to play. Commentators were so struck by the beauty of this game that they dubbed him Evergreen Rashid. Tal was so overwhelmed by Rashid's art that he later told a journalist that this is the happiest day of my life. Sadly, the next decade brought little success to Rashid. He did compete in his fifth USSR championship in Kharkov, 1967, but this was an unusual event. It was not difficult to qualify, since 130 players were invited to play in a Swiss tournament. The idea was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution by allowing mass participation in this year's championship. Even against such a diluted pool of talent, Nezhmetinov just barely scored over 50% to share 27th place with 14 other players. Tal, who shared first with Pologaevsky, joked that the Swiss system is good, we should adopt it again for the 100-year anniversary of the revolution. In 1973, Nezhmetinov traveled to the ancient city of Dogovpils to compete in the Latvian Open. Rashid was now 60, and his hard-living past was catching up with him. He fell ill during the tournament, managing only shared third against a less-than-stellar field. He did not finish his last game. I am both sad and pleased that Rashid Gibiatovich came to my home in Latvia for his last tournament. He did not take first place, but the prize for beauty, as always, he took with him, Mikhail Tal. Nezhmetinov did indeed add a final brilliancy prize to a long, long list of games for the ages. Rashid. Black to play versus Karushev. In the last few years of his life, however, Rashid did not abandon chess. 
He continued to coach the Kazan chess team and gave many simultaneous exhibitions. He worked especially hard on cultivating the development of young players. Rashid became mentor to a whole new generation of Kazan chess masters and enthusiasts. As Kazan historian Lilya Sabirov explains, Nezhmetinov maintained his optimism and good cheer to the end. He lived in Bauman Street, above the grocery store near the church. He often walked to the old city chess club. You could go right up to him with a greeting, and he'd turn to you with raised eyebrow. With whom do I have the pleasure to speak? he'd say. And he'd discuss any topic, chess, literature, history, just about anything at all. Lilia Sabirov. Rashid Gibiatovich Nezhmetinov died in the summer of 1974, and his legacy has proven vexing for many. Why, for example, did he never become a Grand Master? Some say he was discriminated against because he was a Tatar or a Muslim, that he was not given as many chances to play abroad. You'd never hear anything like that from Rashid himself, however. I came into chess too late, a 17-year-old old man with no theoretical training. Yes, I could play some games with brilliance and win prizes for beauty and creative content, but I was never able to achieve the holistic skills necessary for Grandmaster level. Rashid Nizhmetinov Perhaps Rashid's legacy is best explained by his fellow masters. If he had the attack, he could assassinate anybody. Yuri Averbach. Rashid Nezhmetinov is a virtuoso. David Bronstein. No one understands combinations like Nezhmetinov. Mikhail Botvinnik. Nezhmetinov, he was, to the highest degree, Grand Master of Chess Beauty, Max Oeuvre. Players die, tournaments are forgotten, but the works of great artists are left behind them to live on forever, Mikhail Tal. <laughs>